All right, Sanjeev, it looks like the numbers um, are leveling off. A uh, bunch of uh, participants have come on in. So at this point, I am going to get off camera and um, hand the microphone over to you. Thank you very much, Orly. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to today's uh, webinar on ITAR compliance and how to avoid pitfalls that could lead to something as large as a $20 million fine. So very often organizations that handle controlled unclassified information from the Department of Defense are also subject to DFARS and soon CMMC. But the very same organizations also have data that is subject to ITAR export controls. And you'll ask, well, why is that? And that's because by definition, ITAR are export regulations that specifically apply to military goods and therefore defense companies. So it stands to reason that uh, companies subject to DFARS and CMMC are often subject to ITAR as well. Now, ITAR regulations, as many of us know, are complex to understand. Fundamental questions like who is authorized to access ITAR data? How should it be properly identified? How should it be securely stored and shared are basic questions that need to be understood, but are shrouded in complexity. So in today's webinar, we will start by having Matt Henson of TC Engines, who's an expert in trade compliance, to first provide us with guidance on what are the fundamentals of compliance regulations for ITAR. He will then also walk us through a real case study of a company that made certain compliance errors, resulting in a $20 million fine. Matt will describe the key areas that the company aired in implementing its ITAR program. Matt is a trade compliance professional who has spent his entire career working in the intersection of global commerce, export regulations, and information technology. He specializes in the automation of trade compliance processes and controls, and thereby avoiding some of the manual errors that are often leading to fines, and has a huge focus on identification, control, and tracking of regulated information. So once we have established a baseline with Matt on ITA regulations, gone through the basic errors, I, Sanjeev, uh, chairman and co-founder of Prevail, who built end-to-end -end encrypted email and file sharing systems to store and share information, will introduce you to a new ITAR regulation, which is called 120.54. It's a federal regulation, but it's also loosely referred to as the end-to-end -end encryption carva. And this regulation not only simplifies ITAR compliance by enabling the use of low-cost end-to-end -end encrypted cloud services that are easy to deploy, but can also simplify our CMMC DFAR 7012 and INIST 800-171 compliance. And instead of deploying point solutions and handling each compliance framework separately, it can be helpful for defense companies to address all compliance mandates in an integrated fashion. I'll describe in detail the ITAR end-to-end -end encryption carve-out regulation, and why it offers significant simplification versus the status quo. Finally, we'll move on to audience questions. Given the complexity of the topic, there are bound to be numerous questions. And we encourage you to keep putting them into the chat. And a member of our compliance team will get back to you, even if we aren't able to address them live. So please feel free to ask questions on your mind. They may be basic questions or advanced questions. So that's the flow of our webinar. And with that, welcome, Matt, and over to you to walk us through basics of compliance regulations and how to avoid pitfalls that resulted in a $20 million fine. Awesome. Thank you, Sanjeev. All right. Pulling up the uh, presentation. You see that there? Yeah. Could you make it All in... Right. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Presentation mode, please. All right. So in general, we're, we're going to be talking about ITAR compliance. As Sanjeev said, we'll cover some fundamentals and, and we'll look at it 
uh, from a case study, uh, from a consent agreement perspective, failures, and, and we'll talk uh, about different solutions, primarily on the IT side, uh, since we're dealing with uh, primarily looking at, at data concerns in this in this presentation. Um, I'll give a, a quick intro. Uh, Sanjeev's already done a great job. We'll get through that pretty quick. We'll talk about uh, div compliance set, explain that concept. Uh, we'll touch on why you should care about export compliance. We'll look at the fundamentals and then again, look at the consent agreements. So Sanjeev pretty much already covered this. Um, you know, the one thing that I, I wanted to touch on here is that I'm a consent agreement geek. I've worked a bunch of consent agreements, uh, all focused on the intersection of IT and ITAR requirements. And today we help companies address what we refer to as DIP compliance debt. This is essentially our mission. So DIP compliance debt is prolific. It exists at multiple uh, companies within the defense industrial base. And uh, it, it stems from what we call the non known unknowns. So we have unknown data in unknown locations. We have unknown users with potential access. We have unknown users actually accessing the information and th this is an important distinction and we'll explain why as we look at some of the consent agreement uh, failures. Uh, we have unknown transfers of unknown data to unknown users and we have unknown retransfers of unknown data to unknown users and the bottom line is that the div must implement capabilities to identify, control, track, and remediate export control of information. We'll go into more detail on that momentarily. But what do we mean by identify? Well, we have to tag and mark the information for uh, safeguarding and compliant release use cases. And we'll explain those here in a few slides. And then from a control tracking and remediation perspective, uh, it's all about location access, transfer and retransfer controls tracking and remediation. And these are the capabilities that are ultimately required to safeguard and compliantly release the information. So why, why should we care? Uh, about IT security and export compliance. Well, um, we'll ask a rhetorical question here. Does anyone know what this is? Uh, this is from an event in 1991 referred to as a highway of death. So uh, Gulf War I, U.S. launches an offensive against uh, Iraq, which is you know the fourth or fifth most powerful army on the planet during the time. And we absolutely crush the Iraqis. And what happens is that China looks at this and they say, hey, we're using, we're utilizing the same military technology. If we ever want to be taken seriously as a global superpower, um, not only do we need to develop parity, we need to develop leapfrog technologies. And so they start a national cyber espionage strategy uh, focused on develop or leapfrog development. And we're seeing uh, the results of this uh, today, you know, things like hypersonic missiles, right? Well, does anyone know what this is? This is the F-22 Raptor. What about this? That's the J-20 Mighty Dragon. This is China's fifth generation fighter that's developing uh, to rival us uh, from an air superiority perspective. Uh, in an interview uh, uh, by Peter Aiken, uh, former Under Secretary uh, of Defense for Policy, James Anderson said this, what we know is that because of espionage efforts, China's J-20 is more advanced than it otherwise would be. And that's the important point here. And so China is making headway. They are developing advancements uh, with their technology through this uh, cyber espionage uh, strategy. Anybody know what this is? This is Russia's uh, fifth generation fighter. The Chinese have also integrated uh, technology from that platform as well. So a couple of questions we have to ask ourselves, especially from an export compliance perspective. If the data can't be secured, what's the point of export compliance, right? What's well, the point of jump through all the hoops if our would-be adversaries get access to the information anyway? If the data can only be secured, if we can only lock it down to U.S. locations and U.S. persons and that sort of thing, Again, what's the point of export compliance? Export compliance is all about compliant release and collaborating with our international partners. And that's more important than ever is, is that we be able to securely collaborate with our international allies, right? At some point in time, and it seems to be getting closer every day, 
our, our, our men and women will likely have to encounter the J-20 in the South China Sea, right? So it's more important than ever that we work with our allies to secure, you know, securely and compliantly collaborate and develop these advanced capabilities. So export compliance fundamentals. Uh, this is just an introduction. We're gonna start very basic and then we're gonna jump into some more advanced concepts and hopefully explain them in a way that's easily consumable. So we're gonna start with the fundamental question and we're gonna come back and revisit this throughout the presentation today. Uh, th this is a question all compliance programs must answer. And it's what information is required for accurate and timely decisions. Uh, if if a, you don't have the information required for an accurate and timely decision, the decision's either not going to be accurate or it's not gonna be timely, right? We're gonna delay, we're going to delay the export transaction for 120 days while we classify and go get a license. Right. So what, what is export compliance? Well, it's, it's the execution of business transactions in accordance with laws and regulations governing exports. And this is done through uh, or implemented through things like frameworks, policies, processes, procedures, tools, training, personnel, records, and reports. And it, and it looks and, and remediation. And it really looks like this, a system of compliance. So you have your framework. These are your standardized set of capabilities and control, controls and requirements to finding export compliance programs. Uh, we see frameworks being used in security, right? It's kind of old news there, uh, but few folks are integrating their export compliance requirements into those frameworks in a way that can be implemented by IT. So frameworks establish the controls, your policies, institutionalize, uh, the, the control saying, hey, we got to go do these things. We got your process, which is a step-by-step -step instructions or step-by-step -step workflow uh, that describes uh, how you execute compliance with the policy. You have your procedures that explain uh, the process. You have your tools that enable, enforce, and support policy process procedure compliance, your training, your people, your records, your reports, and finally, your remediation, right? If you're if you're encountering issues within your compliance program, uh, you know, cleaning up the DIV compliance debt and implementing enhanced transactional controls is where the remediation continuous improvement comes in. Now, a couple of things to be uh, wary of in, in, in your ITAR compliance program approach. So companies will say, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna enhance our policy. You know, we're, we're certainly gonna get our ITAR procedures in line. We're gonna go out and we're gonna train our people and they're gonna keep the records, right? And what ends up happening with this is you incur uh, manual process debt and extreme overhead in these scenarios. And these lead to something called process spillover, right? So if you have a 150 step process to export data, the business is gonna find a way to get their job done and they're gonna go around your process. And we'll see examples of that uh, today. So U.S. export regulations, uh, you know, the, we're, we're going to cover two today, the ITAR and the EAR. Uh, there are other regulations that, that, imp, that govern exports, you know, uh, agriculture, uh, energy, that sort of thing. Uh, but how, how are the export regulations uh, established? Well, Congress passes the laws. Um, so you've got the Export Administration Act and the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. Um, that Congress uh, ha has created, and then you have the Arms Export Control Act. Congress empowers the president. Uh, the president empowers the Department of Commerce and the Department of State uh, to, to uh, develop the regulations, right? Uh, within each, each of the uh, commerce and state, you've got the Bureau of Industry Security on the left-hand side, and the Director of Defense Trade Controls on the right-hand side, these are the regulators that again uh, are responsible for the regulations, uh, the Export Administration regulations on the left and the International Traffic and Arms Regulation, All right? And then each one of these regulations has what's called a control list. So uh, you've got the Commerce Control List and the EAR and the United States Munitions List uh, in the ITAR. And this defines what is controlled why it's controlled, and ultimately that helps you determine how it's controlled. So over on the left, these regulations are uh, laws and regulations address commercial or du dual use items. Over here on the right, they address military items. Uh, 
you know, I, I described the difference between the commercial and the military side from a risk perspective. Uh, you know, it's killer bees or murder hornets. You know, pick your poison, right? Both are painful and and can put you in a bad spot. But we're going to focus today on the uh, military items, and specifically, we're going to focus on something uh, we call export controlled information or ITAR ECI. So what is ECI? It's an umbrella term. Uh, it, it's a country re regime agnostic term uh, that describes information subject to any country's regulation. So it could be technical data under the ITAR, technology under the EAR, or any other country's definition of, you know, uh, what is controlled. And generally, uh, ECI, right, is defining these regulations as information required for design, development, production, manufacture, assembly, testing, operation, maintenance, repair, or modification of export regulated materials, equipment, fixture, tooling, parts, components, end items, or software. Uh, there's a lot of overlap with, with CUI. So the, this definition basically directly aligns with uh, uh, CTI, EXPT and EXPT R from a uh, um, from a CUI perspective. So this is something to be aware of as you're uh, looking at capabilities and remediations for this type of information. Lots of uh, opportunity uh, to develop joint use cases to go after, and I'm sure we'll have questions and talk about that some more. So we we mentioned the the concept of safeguarding the client release earlier. Uh, so within the context of ECI, let, let's look at these. So there are two approaches to export compliance. The first is export compliance through export prevention. Right. So we prevent unauthorized exports by preventing all exports. And this is where a lot of companies, uh, especially on the you know medium to small size, you, you know uh, attempt to go. Right. So we're going to lock the data down to U.S. locations and U.S. persons only, right? So the other approach is release enablement. And this is where you go out and you sure that all exports are validated against something called a prior approval, right? A license, agreement, exemption, exception, that sort of thing. We'll, we'll talk about that more here in, here in uh, a minute. Uh, but the prior approvals are in place, the records are kept, and the reports are filed. For example, the exports authorized under a valid license. And this is the difference between safeguarding and compliant release, right? Now, safeguarding is, is fairly straightforward. Um, from a data identification perspective, right, we need to know a few things. We need to know whether or not the, the information is ECI. And if it is ECI, we need to know what the country of control is. So, hey, if we have US ECI, we can lock it down to the US, for example. If we want to do compliant release, uh, it's more complicated. It requires more fine-grained attributes. Right, we have to know things like jurisdiction, classification, and the export authorization for that information to determine compliant release. So, this goes back to the fundamental question, right? What information do you need for accurate and timely export control decisions? So, we certainly have to know information about our information, right? And this applies to both uh, unstructured and structured ECI. So how do exports occur or ECI exports specifically occur? Well, uh, they can occur through data location. You know, if you have information in an unencrypted form that's outside of the United States, that data has been, you know, that data has been exported. Um, it can occur through data access. So regardless of where the, where the data is at, if you have non-US persons accessing the ITAR information, that data is being exported. You have data transfers. You sit, put a ITAR attachment in an email and send it uh, to someone outside the country. It's being exported, and there's some other email risks that we'll we'll look at later later down the road as well. But then you've got retransfers. If you send that information uh, to a UK supplier and that UK supplier sends it to some other company in the UK or outside the UK, right? Um, you have things called retransfers and re-exports under the, under the regulations that are occurring in those circumstances. And then you've got data decryption. And Sanjeev's going to go in, into more detail on this, but uh, there's an important definition under 120.50 of release. And so we'll take a quick look at that here. <clears throat> 
So uh, 120.54, and again, Sanjeev's going to cover this. These are activities that are not exports, re-exports, retransfers, or temporary imports, right? So basically what this says is this is in an encryption carve out uh, that Sanjeev mentioned. But what you can see here is that you provide, if you provide that cryptographic key to uh, end users, right? This is where you get the concept of release. So uh, the use of access information to cause or enable a foreign person, including yourself, to access, view, or possess unencrypted technical data, right? The use of access information to cause technical data outside the United States to be a, an unencrypted form. So certainly if you're using encryption and rights management, um, you know, the management of those keys is, is becoming increasingly important. Uh, one thing to note here is even if the data is encrypted, and you provide a key to someone, uh, a secure violation is, is still a violation, right? There are still things that have to take place prior to this release occurring. So let's talk about that. What is compliant release and how does it work from a trick compliance perspective? Well, there's a really important concept and I'm not gonna read all this to you here, but essentially what this says is that, and this is an approach that every, every country takes, they say you have to have an explicit approval from the government to export. And that explicit approval either comes in the form, it's institutionalized in the regulations in the form of an exemption or exception. Hey, if your transaction meets this criteria, you can use this exemption or exception. Uh, if you don't have an exemption or exception available for the transaction, you have to apply for uh, a license or uh, to the government. And so these export authorizations are used to enable compliant release. So in the absence of an export authorization, compliant release cannot occur, right? Only violations. So what is a compliant release decision? What does it look like? Well, you've got some sort of business transaction out here and there are transactional attributes associated with that. You know, there are certain objects involved. This could be material, hardware, software, or information. You're gonna have entities involved, right? Other companies that, that are part of that transaction. And then you're gonna have individuals involved, certainly in the case of data access, for example, all right? And all this information is provided to a decision maker who performs a prior approval match. You know, is there an authorization in place? Then your records are kept and your reports are filed. In some, case, in some cases, there are mandatory reporting requirements. But the question is, how is this prior approval match made? And I want you to keep in mind the fundamental question as we look at this. What information is required for accurate and timely decisions? So let's flip the model on its head here to gain a little bit of real estate. So we've got the transactional control point at the top, and we've got our objects, our entities, and our individuals. And there are certain attributes about each one of those that we have to know, right? Uh, for objects, we might need to know jurisdiction classification. For entities, uh, name, address, country. Individuals could be citizenships, could be nationalities, could be uh, locations, right? These are the attributes that you have to define, right? You have to build these models and understand those, right? Uh, in order to, to, to make this, this transaction uh, and uh, work and be able to process the compliant release decision. So these transactional attributes are made available to decision makers who have access to an export authorization store. And the export authorizations have the exact same model. And typically the way this is done is you've got a human in the middle, a decision maker, that's determining whether or not there's a prior approval match. And it's a three-way match. Well, and again, this is answering the fundamental question, right? What, what information does this person need to have available to them to make the, this accurate and timely decision. So again, it's a three-way match. Uh, if anything is off, you know, for example, classifications off or maybe countries off or perhaps uh, citizenship is off, these transactions have to be blocked um, uh, for, for review. And there's one more piece here, restricted party screening, right? If, if it, the entities or individuals are determined to be bad actors on a, on a list somewhere, right? We have to block these transactions uh, from occurring and, and perform manual review of those. So ultimately, 
right? The objective is to automate this prior approval match and manage by exception. And this is something that's been done for decades now uh, with in the physical export realm where we're doing uh, physical shipments, right? So products like SAP uh, GTS, uh, you know, automate this decision process for export shipments. Um, in terms of IT security capabilities and, and ECI, automation of this decision process is referred to as zero trust. So this is a concept I've written quite a bit about. I encourage you to, to, to dive in and start pulling this thread from an IT perspective, right? Um, to, to start to understand how zero trust enables this. So ECI safeguarding and compliant release decision-making is zero trust. Um, within the zero trust model, you have uh, a safeguarding and compliant release decision model, right? So how are we gonna perform these decisions? What are the steps to performing those decisions? And then you have to supply that model with export author authorization attributes, user attributes, and ECI attributes. Uh, again, we're going back to the fundamental question. What information do you need for an accurate and timely decision? Developing this model is one of the most important steps that, that you can take uh, on, in your journey here. Um, one thing to understand about zero trust is by design, the starting point is to deny um, all transactions, including safeguarding, like US to US transfers, uh, require a release authority. And the way this works, uh, it, it's again, similar to the way automated export shipping controls work. You have a business app out here, it sends the transactions attributes uh, through an API to an automated decision engine uh, that's got a set of rules uh, that run and it has access to your release authority store and essentially returns uh, allow or deny decision, which is enforced in the app. And then all decisions are logged, which supports your audits, your investigations, and your compliant record keeping. Uh, if we think about the business from, uh, you know, as a data flow pipeline, um, zero trust works by enabling or opening up different flows. So for example, we may enable domestic collaboration where we have ECI. Where we don't have ECI, we would enable um, international collaboration. Right, and then we've got things that are going to be released under prior approval, things that we have export authorizations for, and then we have things that may trigger uh, an exception in in human review. And the objective here is to grow what's released under prior approval over time, thus maximizing compliant global trade. Um, when we look at this maximizing compliant global trade, we've got the different prior approvals. So for like EAR ninety nine information. Uh, will have no license required. You know, from an ITAR perspective, no license required is one of the most important authorizations to bring online because it eliminates noise from the channel and allows you to focus on the, the, the more important high-risk transactions. Then you'll have a series of, you know, exemptions or exceptions uh, that, that have to be brought online. And then you have all your licensable transactions, you know, things going out under Department of Commerce or Department of State Export Authorization. And this area here uh, is often a gray area. You know, folks know if they have ITAR data, they gotta get a license. They know if they have NLR, they can pretty much transact anywhere with a few limitations. Um, but it's the stuff here in the middle uh, that, that's, that can be challenging for the compliance programs. All right, so let's jump into consent agreements. You know, what, what are they, how do they happen? And what are the consequences of non-compliance? So uh, this comes right from the Farm Estates website. I encourage you to go look there. It's a great resource. Uh, look up consent, consent agreements, read them yourself. Uh, but a consent agreement typically consists of, you know, review, audit, and reporting requirements. Uh, you have to implement compliance program improvements. Um, you could be debarred. Your export privileges could be revoked. Typically includes the appointment of a special compliance official. Sometimes it's internally, often it's external, very expensive. Uh, and then monitoring by uh, D DTCC, um, which, you know, we're the government, we're here to help. And they typically run three to four years. And uh, they can have civil and criminal penalties. You can't go to jail. Um, but the fines can range up to a million dollars per violation. 
And when you start talking about automation of violations through say bad architecture, this can get expensive really, really quickly. Um, uh, one other one other note here, uh, uh, Sanjeev was mentioning, you know, $20 million fine. My experience on a consent agreement is the fine is one thing. It's the remedial measures that are actually expensive. And companies are typically spending two to three times, perhaps even four times, their fine amount to implement the remedial measures. So it's way more expensive than just the $20 million fine. Uh, consent agreements consist typically of, of three components, or they do consist of three components. The first is a proposed charging letter that what went wrong. This is a description of alleged charges and violations. Uh, they had the consent agreement uh, itself. These are the thou shouts, all the remedial measures you have to go put in place. And then they have the order, which is a summary of the PCL and the consent agreement. Uh, it includes the penalties and payment schedule, and it's also signed by your CEO. Matt, um, if it's okay with you, uh, given the time constraints over here, might we request that you move to the actual case study over here? Because we have about five minutes more for your yeah. presentation. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get through here real quick. So uh, how, do, how do consent agreements happen? Well, you have a voluntary disclosure or mandatory uh, disclosure, or you could get a director disclosure to the Department of State to find out about something. And what happens is you have multiple repeat violations uh, willful violations, those sorts of things, and your risk grows, uh, you know, uh, can, uh, grow significantly with each one of these. D DDTC will perceive systemic gaps. How do you know? Well, it's, you get a re receipt of a non-standard response. It says, hey, tell us more information. Um, from a failures perspective, we're going to look at uh, some trends, some of the top risks. Uh, IT strategy, IT architecture, administration, data location access, data transfers, and we'll get through these pretty quick. Uh, this is analysis of a 2018 uh, consent agreement of FLIR. What you see here is that failures to identify, control, and track ITAR ECI resulted in more than half of their violations. Uh, this is a trend that we're seeing uptick uh, within consent agreements. Uh, this is basically the top risk from a cons that I'm seeing throughout the entire dib, and this is ECI on open file shares. So the grant and employees uh, access, they had about 1,350 foreign personal employees get access to about 1,400 files on 22 non-US servers. Uh, even though they couldn't prove or disprove that the folks did actually access the information, Department of State decided it was necessary for the job performance, and thus, uh, you know, this was a significant contributing factor to their consent agreement. Uh, more recently, we have uh, 3D systems. And uh, one of the first things that caught my attention is, hey, you know, do you, IT didn't have a comprehensive strategy to implement ITAR compliance requirements. Well, how many companies out there have this? Very, very few, right? Um, and how many people have IT personnel that are knowledgeable of ECI requirements? How many companies have actually published ECI requirements for IT to consume, right? And so, you know, focusing in on what are those uh, ECI requirements for IT is a key step in, in addressing this issue. We also have IT architecture failures. Uh, this is four years worth of automated export violations due to email architecture, right? Uh, certainly there were good there was a good business decision behind this, right? It made a lot of sense, but those can lead to the wrong compliance outcomes. Uh, because it was email, it impacted all the customers and suppliers. So all the emails being sent to customers and suppliers were actually mirrored in Germany, resulting in exports of all that information to Germany. Uh, we had multiple repeat violations, right? Which uh, added to the consent agreement. Uh, that email was unencrypted. So, what types of solutions do you need to help address this? Well, the first is IT asset management solutions. So knowing what your systems are, where they're located, and where that information is being processed and stored. So you have to understand your IT landscape just like you would your physical landscape. Uh, encryption solutions can also help address this risk, and Sanjeev will talk about that in a few slides. From an IT administration failure, we had four person IT admins with potential access or the ability to grant themselves potential access. Uh, the solution for this from an IT perspective is privilege access management or a PAM solution. 
uh, where you can implement controls over uh, what IT folks can actually do. And you can record all those sessions uh, and even include things like, hey, we saw a high-risk transaction. Let's go in and, and take a look at that. From a location access failure, this is again, ECI on open file shares. We are already kind of touched on this. Uh, the default window setting uh, for Windows file share is open access. Uh, by default, the shares don't log user access. Uh, we also had four persons and roles necessitating ECI access. All right. Well, the solutions for this are file tagging and scanning solutions. You have to be able to identify your ECI before you can control location access and transfers. So the file tagging solutions help you identify. Then the scanning solutions tell you where the data is located, who has potential access, and who's actually accessing. From a form person role necessitating ECI access, uh, I, I like using a, what I call function-based risk matrix. Looks at the likelihood of people to receive, create, or otherwise handle ECI. And this has this approach has to be integrated into your identity access management solution uh, to ensure compliant access controls. Also, a number of uh, unauthorized data transfers. So we had unauthorized exports, a couple different uh, scenarios here, we have unauthorized retransfers, we have unauthorized re-exports. And the point here is there weren't a whole lot, only 69 unauthorized ECI transactions. Think about the thousands, if not millions of emails and data access transactions that are ha happening in your company today. Uh, certainly once data leaves your security environment, uh, unauthorized transfers, uh, or retransfers and re-exports. This can really only be addressed through encryption, you know, extending your controls to that information once it leaves. Then you've got process procedure and tooling. So access, uh, you know, looking, that is typically how people address this. They implement a process, a procedure, they give them a tool to say, here's how you go out and compliantly transfer. You really have to be concerned about manual compliance debt and process spillover here. If you have a very onerous process, right? you're gonna get process spillover. People are gonna go out and find a way to get their job done. And this is an example from the Honeywell 2021 uh, consent agreement, which also had significant issues at, uh, from an RFQ perspective. So a lot of similarities between uh, Honeywell and 3DS and their consent agreements. All right, Sanjeev, back to you. Well, thank you, um, Matt. Uh, so that was quite a lot of information that Matt shared. And I'm going to try to offer some hope in terms of the enormous complexity that Matt alluded to, which is probably beyond the reach of most small to medium or even large you know, enterprises. And fortunately, there are regulations that now exist that can simplify such that many of these errors that occurred leading to a $20 million fine, such as you know, unencrypted emails on foreign servers in Germany where people get access to their information, file storage and sharing systems where unauthorized access could occur, et cetera, can be eliminated. So let's start with what this regulation is. And I wanna first again emphasize you know, as Matt pointed out, ITAR is a form of controlled and classified information specifically for military companies. And this 120.54 end-to-end -end encryption carve out is what enables you to simplify dealing with your ITAR information. So in the past, if you had ITAR information, you know, you were saying, okay, I can either build a solution where I secure that information on-premise using my hardware, ensuring only US persons have access to it, implementing specific software that kind of locks it down. And now you got the challenge, how do you share this thing when you want to go and share it with the foreign subsidiary? To, to handle these, you know, GovCloud solutions came up and those were uh, Microsoft as GCC High, AWS GovCloud. And they were designed as cloud solutions where they're manned by US personnel, they're on US soil. But as many of you know, you know, if you wanna use a GCC high-like solution, you gotta rip everything out and go we'll replace it with the GCCI solution. But in essence, they kind of make your life easier because you got a cloud solution where you can get 
you know, to control the servers, ensure US persons have access to it so that you're locking down your data and are able to share that appropriately. So what if you didn't want to go do rip and replaces and so forth, and yet wanted to comply? And so this is where this new regulation that's called ITAR, end-to-end -end encryption carve-out comes in. It basically says that you can send, store, or share ITAR data provided you do only three things. And unlike the other stuff that Matt had pointed out, all you gotta do is, is to ensure only three things in your IT systems. The first thing is that ITAR data must be secured using end-to-end -end encryption. And I'll describe what that is. Second, it must be using FIPS 140-2 or its successors as encryption algorithms. And third, and most importantly, if you're using a cloud service, the decryption capabilities must not be available to the cloud service provider or any third party. Only the authorized people who are having access to the information and are sharing it with authorized people must have, act, must have the ability to decrypt the information no one else. So all it requires is just these three controls. And now when you do that, you can basically use your existing Office 365 or G Suite, et cetera, deploy a system, which is an email or a file sharing system that follows these three guidelines for end-to-end -end encryption, no access to the cloud service of the decryption capabilities and using you know, appropriate encryption algorithms. And once you do that, you know, you got yourself covered on a substantial part and avoid the kinds of risks that came with the $20 million fine where the servers were in Germany, unencrypted information was available over there, information was being mirrored in foreign locations, and foreign personnel were able to access unencrypted data, et cetera. And what's nice is if you're a military organization subject to DFARS and CMMC, the very same systems can be used for DFARS and CMMC compliant. So let's try to understand this a little bit more. So I'm gonna refer back to the consent agreement that Matt had referred to. Essentially what was happening is, and this is what happens in a traditional email system, suppose, or a file sharing system. I'm going to give an example. You send an email, it goes encrypted in transit from the sender, goes to that company's mail server, to the receiving company's mail server, and then delivered at the end. I'm gonna show this again. Sends encrypted in transit, stored encrypted at rest, receiving company servers, and then delivered. Suppose the receiving company server was in Germany. What's important is, even if the information is encrypted in transit and encrypted at rest, the servers have the ability to look at that unencrypted information. And so if the server is in Germany, somebody who's a German can access that information and you've just got an ITAR violation. If you have encrypted, unencrypted information for a file store, same thing. So here's how the new regulation sort of helps out. With end-to-end -end encryption, what occurs is the information is encrypted by the sender, stored encrypted on the server, and delivered encrypted to the recipient. Unlike the prior case, the servers have no ability to decrypt the information. I again go back to the previous one. If you have encryption in transit and encryption at rest, it is not end-to-end -end encryption because the servers can look at that information Therefore, any admin who has access to that information can look at it, and therefore, so can the attacker. In an end-to-end -end encrypted system, the servers have no ability to decrypt the information. That's the first criteria that's asked in the end-to-end -end encryption carve-out. The cloud provider has no ability to decrypt the information, and it's using appropriate information. When you do all of that, now you can avoid all these errors that occurred. Because if the server is in Germany, which doesn't need to be, obviously, you can have that on sovereign soil over here, that information can no longer be decrypted. And therefore, the government basically under the end-to-end -end encryption carve-out says, hey, no export occurred over here. 
And so once you have ITAR data, and again, you send it from the sender, it's stored in into an encrypted, only the recipient can decrypt it. Now you basically, it's not an export because the cloud provider can't decrypt it. No admin over there can decrypt it. Now you still have to ensure that the sender and the recipient are authorized to receive that information. But from the perspective of your IT systems, you've made a dramatic improvement in terms of both the security of it and the cost of it, because you're not ripping and replacing. You're basically using your existing Office 365 and G Suite, et cetera. You're applying end to an encryption. And again, I showed you an example of email. The very same thing can occur with file sharing systems as well. So summarizing this thing, when you're looking at the end-to-end the -end encryption carve-out, let's look at the presentation that Matt had made. Matt basically said, look, if you got ITAR data, you got to ascertain that the persons that are sending are authorized people. You got to do that. The person who's receiving is authorized. And if it's military information, generally speaking, only US persons, which is companies or individuals can have access to it. But when you use this end-to-end -end encryption carve out, now the encrypted information is never decrypted on the servers. So you have eliminated the kinds of errors that occurred, which were, hey, I got to worry about where the server is, who has access to the decrypted information? The answer is nobody because it's always end-to-end -end encrypted. The server can never decrypt the information. So you've just grossly simplified your, your challenge. The second, you're properly encrypting it. And the proper encryption is important over here because if you just said, hey, I'm just using my own homegrown encryption, the regulations don't apply to you. You know, you got to use proper encryption so that the government and again, section 120.54 has confidence that that information cannot be decrypted. And third, and most importantly, the cloud provider that you're using cannot decrypt it. Because again, suppose that the cloud provider could decrypt the information, what use is there? Because now the cloud provider needs to ensure that all personnel are US personnel, et cetera. And if it's again ensured that the cloud provider has no access to the decrypted information, then the restrictions on who has access to the servers, et cetera, go away. And now these three constraints are met by modern cloud systems. You can use this carve out to dramatically reduce the price and the complexity of your you know, ITAR compliance. And it turns out the very same things can be applied for DFARS and CMMC. And there you have it where all the significant complexity that was shared doesn't entirely go away, but is dramatically simplified. And hopefully you get a sense for how some of the key elements of unencrypted file shares, servers in unauthorized countries, et cetera, are taken care of. And that's how you basically use this end-to-end -end encryption carve out to go and not only secure the ITAR information, but also securely and in a compliant manner share that information. And therefore it addresses Matt's key point that it's of limited use if you lock down your information and you can't collaborate. And what the end-to-end -end encryption carve out ensures is properly implemented systems not only allow you to lock down your ITAR information, but also to collaborate with parties, not just in the United States, but in international land as well. So if you got a subsidiary outside the country, if you've got such a system, you can not only store your information securely, but you can share that as well. So that kind of provides you a perspective on what the end-to-end -end encryption carve-out does and how it simplifies stuff. And with that, I'm going to move over to audience questions. Um, Orly, there have been a lot that have been you know, uh, lined up. So why don't you start firing away? Absolutely, Sanjeev. Um, so these are questions that uh, were submitted by our wonderful audience members, um, both before and during this presentation. Um, Matt, I, I, we don't see you, but uh, I assume you're, you're hearing us. 
Um, so here's a basic uh, kind of fundamental question here. What's the best way to quickly determine if a client really needs ITAR and or CMMC versus just CMMC? Um, do you want to take that, Matt? Yeah, for sure. Well, um, there are a couple different ways to, to determine that, right? The CMMC clause or requirement is going to be invoked through uh, DFARS 252.204-7012 um, in, in your contract. So if you're seeing that clause in your contracts, if you're doing business with the DOD, it's going to be in there. Then the CMMC official requirements are going to come to later this year is, is what the rumor is. From an ITAR perspective, you can get ITAR data or EAR data from anybody. Uh, if you're getting technical information from a customer or a supplier, right, that's going to invoke those controls. So those controls in, exist independently of any U.S. government contract, right? So the regulations that apply to the information, regardless of whether or not you're doing business with the government. So I, I would add uh, a few things over here. So if you're a defense contractor, as Matt pointed out, you've got a DFAR 7012 clause that obligates you to protect your information using NIST 800-171 controls. So obviously, if that's the case, when CMMC comes to law, you're going to be having to require CMMC certification for that. As far as ITAR is concerned, suppose that you had an international subsidiary or you were receiving information from an international sub subsidiary or your data was subject to, you know, basically defense, you know, regulations. There's a heavy overlap between DFAR 7012 and ITAR. And it may be the case that some of you recognize, hey, I got a subsidiary that's out there. I exchange information with it. Then it's a clear answer. Well, ITAR applies to you. But even if you do not have currently ITAR data, you may be likely to get that because if you are having a DFAR 7012 clause, you may be involved in a project that's coming up that has international subsidiaries involved, et cetera. And unless you determine under no circumstance am I going to ever be involved in such a project, then you always have the chance that you know ITAR could apply to you. And hence, you've got a rational argument to make that the solutions that you go to implement security and compliance for your DFAR 7012, which is NIST 800-171, ought to be also able to handle ITAR. And what's nice is these end-to-end -end encrypted systems offer one path for you to do so, as do you know, other gov cloud-based solutions um, that exist in the market, as an example, GCC High. Yep. All right, thank you, Sanjeev, in that, on that one. Um, here's a second question that kind of follows up on that first one. Um, can you provide examples of ITAR data that a small company in the DIB might accidentally or unknowingly encounter? Um, why don't you start off with that one, Matt? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, the consent agreement examples that we looked at uh, dealing with the supply chain is, is probably the way that you're going to get that information. You're going to receive an RFQ uh, that has a bill of print drawing in it, and that bill of print drawing is going to be ITAR could come via email, could come through some type of portal, uh, but that's the most likely way. If, if you're further down the supply chain, you're gonna be getting that uh, ECI flow down uh, from, from one of your customers. So what I'd like to add to that is, you know, again, this notion of flow down is now the law. Basically, if you've got a DFAR 7012 clause, you got 800-171 protections that you need to mandate. If you have suppliers, you need to ensure that they are compliant with that. And so if that happens, you're basically flowing down your DFAR 7012 clause to your suppliers. And if you are a supplier, your prime may be flowing down that to you. So as Matt mentioned, you could be receiving ITAR data, or if you have ITAR data, you could be flowing that down. So now supposing that, you know, you didn't even understand that the ITAR data is coming in. What's nice about these end-to-end -end encrypted carve-out based systems, or if you have properly implemented other solutions for your 800-171 that take into account, you know, ITAR, uh, 
you're in a much better situation because say you got that information and if you're flowing it down to your supplier and you send it on an end-to-end -end encrypted system, well, that's not deemed an export. You're basically in a good situation with that. Or if you were not using end-to-end -end encryption and using a cloud system, again, I'll give the example of a popular one, which is GCC High, which does take into account, you know, ITAR, then, you know, you are in a much better situation because you're already handling, you know, um, the capability to, to deal with ITAR. So I again summarize, you are basically at any point able to either receive ITAR data through being part of a contract as a supplier and therefore having these regulate, regulations in place, uh, being compliant with regulations either through end-to-end -end encryption or otherwise is important because that minimizes your chances of running afoul with the um, ITAR regulations. All right, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so how is ITAR and the handling of it different or equivalent to CUI? So you want to start I, with that, Matt? Um, well, I, I can start with it. Well, I want to first clarify ITAR is CUI. So basically, I, any, again, defense information that is being exported is called ITAR. And ITAR applies to controlled and classified information. Controlled and classified information can be of many types. DOD has its own controlled and classified information. But if you have that CUI and you're exporting that, that's unregulated by ITAR. So it's important to kind of make that uh, distinction that ITAR is basically CUI. And that's why we emphasize that having an integrated approach makes a lot of sense because then you are having the ability to handle what I call quote unquote DOD CUI, Department of Defense CUI and ITAR, both are CUI and you got systems that can handle either of that information in a consistent manner. Matt? Yeah, I think the overlap in, in capabilities is, is really important. You know, not not all ECI is, is CUI. Um, you know, there, there are certainly cases from an IRAD perspective, internal research and development, uh, the, those sorts of things where CUI wouldn't, um, wouldn't be invoked. But um, it all comes down to the same thing. You have to be able to identify, control, and track it, right? So data tagging, data marking, right? All these capabilities that are required from a CY perspective are also required from a, you know, ITAR, EAR perspective, you know, can so, add PII, PHI, all that stuff. I think since we're running out of time, I wanted to ask you this question, Matt, which is from an ITAR perspective, if you forget ECI, just from an ITAR data perspective, is all ITAR data CUI? Not all, not all ITAR data is CUI. Um, there, there, were, if I, if I have ITAR data that I developed on, on my own, right, outside of a DOD contract, I've worked on a project and now I sell it to the DOD, the government, the information that I deliver to the DOD, right, uh, will be CUI, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the data that I developed independently outside of that contract exists as CUI outside of that contract circumstance. So, you know, th this is an important distinction, especially as we're looking at the supply chain impacts, um, you know, of, of NIST 8-171 compliance. Okay. I think with that, uh, we have come to the top of the hour. Again, I emphasize uh, that the invitation always exists for any questions that were posed on the chat, we will absolutely address. Um, but if you have, uh, questions for us at Prevail. Um, it's the email address is info at prevail.com and ask us your questions. We'll answer those. And Orly, could you please flash out uh, Matt's email address in the event that folks want to go and access um, information? Um, we are available. Uh, thank you again for, for your, it's the last slide. Yep, this one. So Matt is Matt dot henson at tcengines.com and uh, info at prevail.com um, 
happy to take any questions on CMMC, DFARS, and ITAR overlap, uh, any questions associated with the end-to-end -end encryption carve-out, and practical examples of email and file sharing systems that exist to implement your ITAR compliance program and therefore avoid some of these horrendous fines that have been occurred by the consent decrees. With that, we appreciate your time and hope that this information was helpful to you in developing your overall compliance program. Thank you very much.